Good morning, Hope. Good morning. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us this morning, and a big thank you to everyone that's joining us online, and a very happy Mother's Day. Make sure you look in your bulletin for other stuff that's going on here at Hope besides what I mentioned because we've got a lot of stuff going on. In your bulletin, there's also a communication card that's a good way that you can let us know how we can pray for you and so we can keep your contact information as well. Our Hope Youth Ministries are during our 10 o'clock and our 1130 service. We are currently in a semester of growth groups. It's a great way to get involved. There's things that happen in circles that don't happen in rows on Sunday. There's a list of them on the back of your bulletin, and I would encourage everybody to get involved with one. Our 24-hour prayer chain is coming up May 30th and 31st. Sign up for a 30-minute slot to, on, to pray on our sign-up sheet. And then on the 31st at 6 p.m., we are having prayer, praise, and pizza. So make sure, even if you don't get a slot on the prayer chain, that you can come to that. It's a great time of prayer and praise. Our Class 101 membership and 201 maturity are going to be on May 21st here at 1 p.m. We encourage everybody to join us for those classes. 101 is membership and 201 is maturity. <coughs> if you maturity is if you've already taken 101 or signed up or signed the membership covenant, just make sure you sign up so we know that you're coming to that. We're going to have a short meet and greet, so take just a minute and say good morning to those around you.
It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgiveness. 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 Show me how. Show me how. Love. 
As we gather this morning as a family, we come to worship. And as the ushers come forward through the next song, they will pass out communion. And as believers in Jesus, as believers of his crucifixion and his resurrection, we are free to take communion together and with God. We serve a God who loves us so much There is nothing that he wouldn't do to be with us. And he made a way by sending his son to die that we could be accepted into God's forever family. And as we take communion this morning, we remember the body and the blood of our Savior Jesus who made a way for us to be eternally accepted.
disappear The dirt has washed away And now it's clear There's only grace There's only love There's only mercy And believe me, it's enough Your sins are gone Without a trace Starting over now under the sun. You're stepping forward now, and new life has begun. Your new life has begun. And there's only grace, there's only love, there's only. sing this next song together, I encourage you to stand as we sing about our Savior who took upon himself what we could not carry. You stood before
Hey, Hope Church Third Service, you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see everybody. Let's give it up for the band. Yeah. You guys rock. Thank you. They work hard. They they practice together. They practice on their own, and then they lead us three times on Sunday. They're awesome. Um, also, we want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in our audience. If you are a mom, I would like to ask you to stand at this time. I've got something for you. You're awesome. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Miss Janie. Happy Mother's Day, Meg. Happy Mother's Day. Glad you're here. Happy Mother's Day. You bet. Happy Mother's Day. Did I get anybody? Got everybody? Awesome. Awesome. Now let's all give a hand for all our moms. Yeah. Love you, ladies. We've had, uh, we had a good turnout of moms today. It was really cool. We had a packed first service in a baptism. We had a second service that was good in baptism that I was late to. Uh, <laughs> so I was outside. But I was trying to get back, but we're learning as we go because of the break being a little shorter. I need to, you know, adapt to that. I should have put my change of clothes in there, but that's more information than you guys care about. But I uh, ran to the cabin and ran back. And... Uh, a lot of good stuff going on. I uh, went on, my wife and I went on the hike yesterday and saw the six highest fall, feather falls in the whole country. And it was awesome, 9.5 miles. Woke up this morning, I didn't even feel sore until I moved. And uh, <laughs> sore from the neck down. It was awesome though. Uh, it's really cool. We live in a beautiful place. Meg uh, announced a couple of items that are really important. And it's a it's a, sp it's a part of who we are, really. The, the class, sometimes we call it class. You'll hear me say that. Class is an acrostic that stands for Christian Life and Service Seminars. 
That's, it's, it's a method to help people uh, go through and get application from the word to serve in their life, to serve God. Also, we call it climbing the mountain of God, and that's a picture of the walk with God. And the first thing you do when you stand at the base of the mountain, that's where our membership class is, uh, is you realize it's really God takes us up the mountain. We don't go on our own strength. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So the first step is to say there is a God and I'm not him, and I want to be a part of his family. And that's what membership's about. We, we go through passages about the fact that God doesn't want anyone to be an orphan, that we all are sons and daughters. And some people have a bad um, reaction to the word family, but the family of God is a forever family with a perfect father who loves you everlasting. And then <clears throat> being part of that family, God takes us up the mountain as we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that's spiritual growth. There's things that we do that help us grow. We don't make ourselves grow. Only God makes things grow. But there's things we can do to get in on the process. And we look at different disciplines and things to help grow. We all grow in different ways. But there's things that we, we will learn in that class. And then you get to the top of the mountain. And that purpose is uh, worship or magnification. And we don't have a seminar for that because we have awesome worship every Sunday and we worship on our own lives. But worship is expressing God, uh, love to God. God loves you, and God made you and I to express love to him. He is ple- Did you know he's pleased by you expressing love to him in worship? And uh, then he says, all right, we're not in heaven yet, so I want you to go down the mountain to get others. And on the way down the mountain, we have 301, which we're going to offer later this year, and that's about finding my shape for ministry. How am I shaped? We all have a unique shape and gifts and abilities. And uh, we, we learn in that seminar about that. And then the last one at the base of the mountain is mission and finding my mission. We all have a life mission, and you can reach people I can't reach. And that seminar is to help in that. You even get a passport at that point because you're a world missionary. And we leave the mountain to go bring others to the mountain of God. Well, I took a little time on that because I want you to know that's part of our strategy. We're going to be putting up pictures of the mountain with those things around it just to be symbols around our campus to remind us that the other thing that is part of who we are is our 24-hour prayer chain that we do seasonally when i came here i said to the board i'm tired of being the senior pastor who has the grand plan and then we all ask god to bless the plan and we decided let's seek god and ask him his plan for us and promise that as he opens doors, we will walk through that. And we go around the clock. You can sign up for a 30-minute segment out in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet. And then you call the person next on the list and say, have a great time with the Lord. I love it because usually we're not calling each other at 2 or 3 in the morning. And that happens around the clock. Then we gather here at 5 uh, for the peas, praise and pizza and prayer. Uh, Tom Thurkington added passionate portuguese pudgy portuguese pastor but those aren't part of it uh we 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 have a great time you know it's one of my favorite gatherings it's a smaller gathering typically um but it's great worship we've been in prayer and we're all praying together we have musicians here that lead us in worship and it's a great time even if for some reason you're not able to sign up for the prayer chain you're welcome to come to that evening that gathering on the 31st when I came here, I did, like I always did in my works, in my, the churches I've worked with, is I wanted to study their documents, their history, what they believe, and make sure I fit it, because I don't want to be a, a mouthpiece for something I don't fit. And so I started studying about Hope Church. First of all, I love the name Hope. I think the worst, two worst words in the English language are no hope. And everybody needs hope. So I love that name, and I think people should go out of here inspired and um, then I looked at the statement, building relationships that last forever. And I loved that because Tracy and I were looking for a relational place. And um, I had a personal mission statement, love God, love people. And that comes from the great commandment where Jesus said to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. And so building relationships that last forever fits because of the relation aspect. And it's forever that's what makes it different about just making friends for this life, but it's forever. And, uh, and so then I looked at family, again, a relational thing. I was looking for a family to work with, and I like that acrostic. 
But the why I really love in family because it's no cookie cutters. Yourself. The why stands for yourself. And I've heard a lot of people comment about that they like that. And I think that some of us can relate to being in experiences where you were told this is what it means to be a Christian and they had a profile and you had to fit this thing and we're all the same and doing the same. And, it's, and really God made us different on, on purpose. <coughs> if you don't be you, nobody's going to be you. And really that's where it comes from with something, the core value I had when I came here that I do believe very strongly since God accepted me is that churches should have a climate of acceptance. A climate of acceptance. And today we're looking at acceptance. I put a definition on the outline. There's a lot of different definitions that are a little more easy, like uh, when you sign the terms for a loan that you want, you accept those terms. Or if you want an app for your phone or your computer, a lot of times they have a little thing where you check the box, terms of agreement, you're accepting that. You don't usually read it. You just want to get the app. But anyway, uh, that's, a, that's acceptance. But this is a little deeper, and this is on a list of definitions that really fits the message today for what I believe the early church dealt with and what we deal with. And that is uh, acceptance is a willingness to tolerate a difficult or unpleasant situation. Sometimes it's hard or difficult to tolerate certain people because they're different than us. Because we're cool, right? And so anybody different, uh, you know. And, uh, and that's how we grow up. There's, there's uh, a challenge with accepting. And I wanna really want to dig into that today, that subject. And then I'm also at the same time, because it's Mother's Day, and we highly esteem mothers around here, we're going to morph it into honoring motherhood at the same time. You may think, well, how, how can you do a message on acceptance and morph it into motherhood? Well, preachers do that all the time. And there was a guy who always preached on baptism every week. Baptism, same old thing, baptism. Finally, the pastoral board said, could you please preach on something else? How about creation? So the guy gets up and he goes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth and all that. And then he says, and the spirit of God hovered over the waters, which brings me to my subject, baptism. So that's how we do it. We work it in. And I'm going to morph motherhood in this message on acceptance. And uh, as kids, usually division started at the playground. And we, we liked certain people, or certain people liked us or didn't like us, and we, grew, we have groups of friends. Sometimes they get bullied or picked on the outs. They're not in, in the in crowd. And then as we grow up, in my day, we had different names. I don't know what they are now. But I don't, my kids are all grown, so I don't get educated on that. But we had jocks and nerds and geeks and stoners and those, those serious uh, student council guys and uh, preppies and just, just different names that we would group people in. We had those who were really rebellious that really dressed wild, but they only hung around with those who were really rebellious and dressed really wild. So you had all these different groups. And then when we become adults, we still do it. Sometimes we're a little more subtle, but we group people in by what they do. We hear it at a, at a gathering of friends or a party. Hey, so what do you do? And we, we categorize people based on what they do or what their net worth is or what they have or what they drive or their stuff or how they look, how they dress. And so we continue it on. We have groups, we have organizations, we have political uh, groups, we have all these different things, but we still segregate. <coughs> and Jesus was about acceptance. You know what blows my mind when I read the stories that Jesus told sometimes? Sometimes he would tell a story and the hero of the story would be the enemy of the audience. It would be someone the audience hated, and Jesus would say, there was a Samaritan, and he's the hero of the story, and the audience hates Samaritans. It cracks me up. And, and he, he taught things like, love your enemies, and don't just be good to those who will be good to you. Be good to all. And he was radical, and he was really into acceptance. And the older I get, the more I see Jesus is about love, and acceptance. And uh, Paul wrote this. He said in Romans 15, 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Accept one another just as what? As Christ. Circle those words, as Christ. Everybody say just as Christ. Just as Christ. Just as Christ. That's a challenging statement right there. Because how does Jesus accept us? Unconditionally. 
He died while we were sinners, not when we got our act together. Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And he loved Jesus, but he struggled with Christianity because of some of the hate he experienced from Christians. In Acts chapter 10, God is going to do something to rock that early church. Because when Jesus said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, you know what they heard him say? They heard him say, make disciples of all Jewish nations. And there was this huge racial and religious divide, uh, divide between Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are anyone who were not Jews. Gentiles is a general description. It's, it's the pagans, uh, the unbelievers of, of the Jewish faith. The Jews were unique in that they were the only ones who believed in one God, and they believed they had a relationship with that God. A lot of people sometimes think that there's not a relationship with God in the Old Testament, but the truth is it, there always has been. Um, Jesus brings us the ability through grace to have that relationship with God. But in the Old Testament, you'll see people like Abraham and Moses talking to God. They had a relationship with him. So it's not a new thing. God always wanted to be our God and for us to be his people. There's a statement I love in the Old Testament where it says Enoch walked with God and then he was not for God took him. What? <laughs> He's a guy evidently was so close to God. God goes, come on home. And uh, so God's a relational God. Now the, the, uh, the Gentiles had multitude of God. And they had shrines, and they had temples, and they, they did some, some horrible stuff like sacrifice babies. They had this little, this little frying pan kind of thing at this Ostrov pole where they would heat a fire up and put their scalding baby on there as a sacrifice to God. It was horrible. God hated that, and you read about it in the Old Testament. They had immorality. They had prostitutes who were priests and priestesses that served in their worship. So, and then they had an immorality lifestyle where uh, orgies were cool, and even if you were married, you could sleep around with whoever. So it was a total different lifestyle. Now, the Jews considered the Gentiles dogs, literally called them dogs, could not go under the same roof to have fellowship and eat with them. And so imagine this huge racial religious divide. It was nasty. And now God wants everyone. He purified a people through the Jews to demonstrate one God walking with God. But the point was always to save all. They had gotten so far away. He wanted to bring through that nation a savior of all. So he allows a miracle at a guy named Cornelius' house. You can read about it in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a military guy. He was a centurion. And he was a centurion for a... a a group called the Italian Regiment. And God was happy about, he was pleased with Cornelius because it says he gave, he was a giver. He gave to poor and he prayed to God. Sometimes people say, well, God doesn't hear unbelievers or, or non-Christian prayers. I disagree with that. In, fa in fact, probably some of you are uh, like me have been away from God in our lifestyles, but we prayed to God. And God looks at the heart and he hears uh, Cornelius' prayer. And an angel comes to Cornelius and he says, your giving and your prayers to God have gone up as a memorial to God. Did you know when you give to help those who are in need, you're bringing a memorial to God. And when you pray, you're walking, talking to God. So he says, I want you to send for a guy named Peter and he's going to come. And, and, and I don't know why God chose it this way, but he chose for his message to be translated through human beings through people. You ever think about that? He could just go boom, 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 and make people go, I believe. But he chooses to send people to share. So we have this contagious virus, a good virus, of the good news that we're supposed to share. And so he's going to send for Peter. Now, the next day around noon, Peter falls into a trance. He's waiting for lunch, and he sees a sheet, looks like a sheet coming down with certain animals on it that they were forbidden to eat under the old law. And God says to him, no longer consider impure what I have made pure. And Peter's like, what? And um, God is trying to get him to understand uh, that, that the Gentiles are no longer impure to him, that they can come to him. And these guys show up from Cornelius' house, and Peter goes with them to Cornelius. Cornelius does the greatest thing a person can do for their friends and family. He gathers all his friends and family to hear the message about Jesus. 
And Peter walks in unheard of into the house to have food, to be with, to fellowship with these Gentiles. And he begins to teach Jesus. And I have a verse 34 that says, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Everybody say that. God does not show favoritism. Say it again. God does not show favoritism. But I'm a ministry leader. I'm totally committed. God and I have a little closer. But I, do you know how long I've been at this church? I have seniority. I've been here. Some, God does not show favoritism. And he, he continues on uh, saying that for anyone who comes to him, God welcomes them. And God is a God of acceptance. And so Peter preaches Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on the people just like it was on the apostles in the beginning of the church that we studied in Acts chapter 2. This outpouring, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, miraculous occurrence. It happens to these Gentiles. And Peter's blown away. And so uh, he baptizes the believers. And this is the beginning of Gentiles coming to Christ. Now he goes to Jerusalem and he's called in on the carpet by the leaders the apostles and the believers, and they criticize him. And they say, you went into the same house and you ate with Gentiles? And Peter told the whole story. And something that God said through the angel three times, a voice said three times from heaven, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Let's say that together. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That's kind of risky business for me to call and categorize and judge someone as unclean when God has made them clean. And I want you to hear the heart of the early church after he explains what happened and how the Gentiles came to Christ. He says in verse 18 of Acts 11, when they heard this, they had no further objected, obje objections and praised God. They were excited about this. They praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. They were excited that these people, so different than them, were going to, to get it, uh, that relationship with God and salvation, we call it, eternal life. That's the heart of the early church. This is huge, huge shift for Jews, Jewish leaders, church leaders, to welcome them. And sadly, we sometimes struggle with that to this day, having that kind of heart that celebrates when anybody comes to the Lord. Remember the definition, willingness to tolerate a difficult or unpleasant situation. When we began seven years ago, we stood together, we said, we don't care who walks through those doors, they're a gift from God. If they're tatted, they're pierced, they're cookers, they're growers, um, they've been in jail, um, Brazilian relationships, or wealthy but crooked, or wealthy with a hole in their heart, having stuff, but something's, whoever comes is welcome. Climate of acceptance. But old habits are hard to change. And even in the early church, after they made this realization that God wants everyone to come to Christ, they began to bind certain teaching of the law, like circumcision, which was a sign of a covenant, an intimate thing between God and his people that he had a relationship with them. Now, the Gentiles didn't need to do that. It was the circumcision of the heart that Paul writes about. God pierces our hearts, and we, we have a relationship with him. But certain Jewish leaders started saying, well, we'll let you become believers, but you have to be circumcised. And so they had this conference, which is called the Jewish, the Jerusalem Conference, a big conference. All the heavies show up. Peter, Paul, James, who was the Lord's brother and a prominent leader at that time. All the, the apostles are there. And different ones talk. And you can read it more fully in Acts 15. But I have a few verses. This is 10 and 11, Acts 15. This is Peter. It says, Now then, why do you try to test the... God, by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No one could live the law perfectly. No, we believe it is through the what? Grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they. 
That verse right there sums it up. We're saved by grace, not behaviorism. Now, James, leader there at that meeting, says this in verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult. Let's say that out loud together. We should not make it difficult. One more time. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I'm saying that over and over because we've got to drive it into our hearts because we struggle with this sometimes. We want to put up our denominational rules or roadblocks or, yeah, if you jump through these hoops, you can be accepted as one of our members. And the heart, the heart of the early church is we should not make it difficult for people to come to God. But old habits die hard. Later, after the Jerusalem conference, Peter falls back in to show him prejudice. He used to eat with the Gentiles and fellowship with them. Like they said, it was fine. They're family. We're family. Then some of the Jewish uh, believers come from Jerusalem, and Peter stops eating with the Gentiles and just hangs out with the Jews. And Paul confronts him. I believe he confronts him publicly because it was a public thing. If it was a private thing, he probably would have done it one-on-one. -on -one. These are the heavies. Peter, who's to the Jews, the apostle to the Jews. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to see this because Paul uh, confronts him after this, after this peer pressure. And I got to say, peer pressure still happens. Yes, we'll accept you if you follow these denominational rules. If you uh, clean yourself up. I've heard of churches telling guys to get their tattoos taken off. I, I seriously know people who did that. I've heard people say, well, if you dress this way. Do you know I used to hear sermons on, is it okay for women to wear pants? So, so ridiculous through the ages. Well, if you read the Bible this much, if you attend church this much, we'll accept you. And don't get me started on music. You know, there are some who believe it has to be a certain kind of music. After all, we all know uh, Peter and, and Paul and Barnabas, they carried around a hymnal, right? We don't even know what kind of music they did. It was chants or psalms, or, but, but it's lyrics is the only thing that makes it Christian. And that doesn't mean I think it helps. What bothers me is when one group says it all has to be a certain way and judges the other group that it's not truly worship. You can't see their hearts. And you could get blinded by spiritual-minded peer pressure. And that's what happens with Peter. And listen to what Paul says. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not a Jew. You know what he's saying to Cephas or Peter? You're not even a very good Jew, Peter, yourself. Who are you to judge the Gentiles? When you're? And then he says, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth, not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Over and over they had to deal with this, and over and over through centuries, churches have struggled with this. And I believe that one of the big reasons we have grown is because 40 people said we will accept anybody who comes in here. And I preached hard about the leper, when lepers were told to get outside of town like a garbage dump. And Jesus comes alone, and he not only heals the leper, he reaches out and touches the leper. And, uh, and I believe those 40 receiving those God started bringing is why we've continued to grow. And it's a challenge to continue to accept anyone different than us that God brings because we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to this verse, Romans 14, 4. And i got to tell you, after growing up, in a church I'm thankful for because I got some good, a focus on follow the Bible, but rules like the name on the building and how you dress and a lot of different things were, they were true, even though they didn't, wouldn't always say it, they were equal to the gospel. And we, people were judged on some of these things or they knew what lifestyle they'd had in town. And, and I read this verse. Who are you to judge someone else's servant. You hear that? Whose servant are we? We're Jesus' servant, right? 
Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. Who's the master? Jesus. So to their own master, Jesus, servants stand or fall. And they will stand for the Lord. Who's able? The Lord is able to make them stand. So we have one rule at Hope, Jesus. We have, I welcome anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus to attend and all that. But when we talk about being members and climbing the mountain of God and our growth as a disciple, we have one rule. It's Jesus. We believe that the Holy Spirit who's given to all believers will help us grow and Jesus will help us grow. And so we purposely choose not to be God's policeman. It was good news. When I found out I'm not supposed to be God's policeman, I got my own crap to work on. <laughs> and I just want to point people to Jesus and pray for people. And I believe as people grow in Christ and they go to Bible studies, they get mentors, they get relationships, they grow as God leads them to grow. There's a story about Mother Teresa where she gave a child, a little child, a, a piece of bread. And she said that the little child started taking it off like a crumb at a time. Just a little crumb at a time. And Mother Teresa said, why don't you just eat it? And she says, I'm afraid if I just eat it, I'll never get another piece of bread. And then Mother Teresa said this, the biggest disease today is not leprosy or tuberculosis, but rather the feeling of being unwanted. The most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. She's saying that in the climate of talking about how sad it is when you hear stories like that little girl and seeing true poverty. But then she said, what her point is, this is the worst poverty. The hunger for love is much more difficult to remove than the hunger for bread. Now, here's where I morph into mothers before we let you go. Nobody's no, is is any more accepting than our moms. If you had a good, healthy mom situation like I did. If you were raised with, uh, with conditional love or perfectionism, which says, I'll love you if you do this, lay down in this mold, and then I'll love you. I am so sorry that that happened. And you know what? You can have moms, and you can mom in the church, even if you don't have biological. I have mothers and fathers in the church, and I mean that with all my heart. And I have children in the church. But moms who are a healthy situation mom. They, my mom would hold up uh, this high standard, but then when I screwed up, she would give me grace. You know, like she would say, uh, over and over, uh, it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation and only a few seconds to destroy it. You can tell I still have a little attitude about hearing that over and over, right? <laughs> like, only a few seconds and I've ruined the whole thing and it's a whole lifetime. But then when I would screw up, which I did a lot, she was the first one to welcome me. I mean, she might say, you need to pay the penalty or make this right, but she would accept me. And then she said this to me over and over from Romans 8. God works together all things for the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't say all things are good. Cancer is not good. I hate cancer. If you were abused or molested or abandoned, that's not good, and that shouldn't have happened to you. Or if you made some bad mistakes, you are human. And here's the good news of that verse. God can take whatever it is that's even bad. If we love him and follow the call according to his purpose, he can work good out of that. And he majors in that. He does that over and over. And my mom would quote that. I'd get dumped. Come home all sad. God works together all things for the good for those who love the Lord and call according to God. And I'd get in trouble uh, with the law. God works together all things for good for those who love the Lord and call the court. You pay your penalty, you make this right. God has a plan for you. My friends all loved my mom. She held that standard, but she was very accepting of them. When we would be out at night, a lot of times I'd spend the night because she'd feed them all good. All these big football player guys, you know, and she would line us up when we would come home from being out that night. So she'd she'd go, uh, so what'd you guys do tonight? She do this. We call it the sniff test along every one of us, and, the, and we're old guys now, and we still laugh about uh, Mama Freitas's sniff test. But she accepted us. Anybody could go to church. We had that drilled into us. Anybody's welcome to go to church. When I was gone from church, uh, out there, trying to do what I thought I was missing—all that fun 
and finding out it wasn't so fun after all. Sin takes you farther than you want to go, and you stay longer than you want to stay, and you pay more than you want to pay. And my mom prayed for me and prayed for me. When I came back, my mom was so happy. Uh, when I started, I got another girl, a special mom in my life, uh, got me back in church, and I started thinking, I'm thinking I want to go into ministry. What's the best way we could help people in the ministry? And I was blown away that I could be forgiven for all the stuff I've done and even work for God. And, uh, and my friends, some of them thought I was insane. They thought, what's he been smoking now? You know, he's lost it. He's lost it. Not my mom. She said, oh, I, I always thought you would be a great preacher. And every high point in my life, I realize now that I called my mom. I realize that after she died, because I keep wanting, Mom, you wouldn't believe what happened at Hope today or whatever. And she, I can't do that. But uh, I've, I've read old letters uh, that I found after we cleared out her stuff after she passed. And I realized that from the beginning of my ministry all the way, I would write a letter, you know, and it would be on the church letterhead. I wanted her to see that, you know, and my name was in the thing. And I would say, hey, Mom, this happened at church. And the reason I would call her a writer because she would go, on and on how awesome it is oh isn't that something wow and uh and when she would come to visit here she loved it up here the word the g word she always used that our whole family jokes about was gorgeous <gasps> isn't it gorgeous look at the manzanita she goes on and on so gorgeous and and she loved our church and we would ride home and every time she visited she'd look at me and do this she'd say you know you're blessed right what she was saying was, don't have a big head. You're very fortunate to have these people who love you. And I knew she was right. And um, when I tried to do things different in the ministry than the fellowship I grew up with, she, she didn't like music the way I did it, but she saw people raising hands, people in tears, worshiping. And she goes, I know what you're doing. You just be who God made you to be. When she visited Hope her last time, I didn't know it was last, but she lied to me. She told me she was going to get well, and she didn't get well. And uh, so the, first, the Saturday night before church, we had three chairs, and mom's chair and me and then my big brother over here. And my mom, was uh, she couldn't breathe well, and she needed help to go to the restroom during the night. And so when she needed to go, she'd say, Ron, I need to go to the restroom. And then she'd pat me and say, you just rest. you got to preach tomorrow. And I loved that. You know, I just sat there, you know, the middle child by mama. And uh, the next night she left me on the, uh, she left me, she got me on duty the next night, so I still didn't get off the hook. But uh, I have this awesome memory etched in my brain I'll never forget. Looking back there, her last time to worship at a church, sitting in a wheelchair with oxygen, sitting up, God packed it on a Christmas service. And she was beaming. And then I had this other girl I knew as a, who started becoming a mom as a young adult and poured her life out and followed her husband's dreams, raised four kids, same thing, high standard, but grace and forgiveness when we screwed up, me included. And then she went through school, put herself, built a career, and I seen in her this little kid I stole from her parents as a kid uh, in jean cutoffs on a little beat up street in Taft has a powerful career and, I, and I've seen in her the power in a woman. Women speak wisdom. Uh, women, I love having women in our leadership team. Women speak wisdom into us. Moms speak wisdom into us. I have moms in the gospel who continue to do that. And I see them all around, these moms, they may have on skirts or business suits or jeans or sweats or yoga pants, but they all say the same kind of things, like, don't touch that. I told you no. Put that back. Or, oh, you got an owie? Let me kiss it. Aren't they great with an owie? Do you remember that? And moms exemplify acceptance. And here at Hope, we honor motherhood. Amen? And we honor women. You know, women have been held back by churches a lot in history, and we want to turn you loose to live that vision, that God dream that God puts in your heart to use your gifts and, ab and abilities. You are valued, and you are the glue that holds us together, and you speak wisdom into us. You speak grace into us. So I want to say a prayer about this.
And uh, let's think about the whole combination of this message, the power of acceptance and also uh, uh, motherhood and the power of women uh, as they speak wisdom into our lives. Father, I thank you that we do have a climate of acceptance and hope. And you've brought together people with diverse backgrounds. That is so awesome. But God, I pray we will not get prideful and think we've arrived, but we'll keep continually trying to welcome anyone that you bring through those doors, no matter how different them they are than from us. Because you created all people. <coughs> the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And Father, I thank you for our moms, for our women, and how powerful they are, God. And we honor women today and our moms. We thank you for that. And uh, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, this time we're going to do something a little different. We're going to stand up and we're going to think about the power of a mom speaking wisdom into her kids.
time to pray for our offering. Yeah. <laughs> Father, we celebrate acceptance and we celebrate moms. We also celebrate giving. And uh, we give cheerfully as you've blessed us. And please make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Love building relationships. Building relationships. Building I thought it was off. <laughs> Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember every single day this week, in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here, everybody, and happy Mother's Day.